So last week we read a first description of the kingdom of subtle matter. We've entered following King Aswapati, the traveler of the worlds. We've started to move up the world stair, the stair of many levels of universal existence. In the first canto, we just saw that there is a huge world pile with many, many different levels. So King Aswapati starts to explore that uh, great mountain. And we read the first 42, 41 lines. I'm going to move on from there. A passage for the powers that move our days. Occult behind this grosser nature's walls. A gossamer marriage hall of mind with form is hidden by a tapestry of dreams. Heaven's meanings steal through it as through a veil. Its inner sight sustains this outer scene. A finer consciousness with happier lines. It has a tact our touch cannot attain. A purity of sense we never feel. Its intercession with the eternal ray inspires our transient earth's brief-lived attempts at beauty and the perfect shape of things. In rooms of the young divinity of power and early play of the eternal child, the embodiments of his outwinging thoughts lave in a bright, everlasting wonder's tints, and lulled by whispers of that lucid air, take dream-hued rest, like birds on timeless trees, before they dive to float on earth time's sea. All that here seems has lovelier semblance there. Whatever our hearts conceive, our heads create, some high original beauty forfeiting, thence exiled, here consent to an earthly tinge. Whatever is here of visible charm and grace finds there its faultless and immortal lines. All that is beautiful here is there divine. Figures are there undreamed by mortal mind. Bodies that have no earthly counterpart traverse the inner eye's illumined trance and ravish the heart with their celestial tread, persuading heaven to inhabit that wonder sphere. The future's marvels wander in its gulfs. Things old and new are fashioned 
in those depths. A carnival of beauty crowds the heights in that magic kingdom of ideal sight. In its antechambers of splendid privacy, matter and soul in conscious union meet, like lovers in a lonely secret place, in the clasp of a passion not yet unfortunate, they join their strength and sweetness and delight, and mingling make the high and low worlds one. I'll stop there. You'll read first, Sebastian. A passage of the powers that move our days. A power behind this grosser nature's walls. A grosser marriage hall of mind with form is hidden by tapestry of dreams. Heaven's meanings steal through it as through a veil. Its inner side sustains this outer sea. Yes. So it's another image that he's giving for this world of subtle matter. First he said it's like a kind of roof or a ceiling that lets um, perfumes and dews from the higher worlds coming, come in. Now he's giving a different um, image. He says, occult, hidden, behind the walls, the, the firm walls of this grosser nature, this gross physical matter that we know in our world, hidden behind our world, there's a marriage hall, a place where marriages happen. And he says it's a gossamer marriage hall where mind unites with form. Our thoughts are more or less formless, no? But there's a place where mind unites with form. And this word gossamer, it has a very, very beautiful um, suggestion. Gosama is the fine silk threads that baby spiders make. <laughs> so when they hatch out of their eggs, they spin out a long thread, incredibly fine. You can't see it normally. Um, but only uh, there are certain days when many young spiders hatch out together and then they, each of them climb up to the top of a stalk of grass and they put out their thread and then they fly away on it like a parachute. So if you see one of those fields where the, the spiders are hatching, it's covered with these lovely silken threads Maybe there are dew drops on it, and then it's reflecting the light, a lovely silver light, gossamer. And it's supposed to be one of the strongest substances in nature. Compared to its, the diameter of those threads, it's stronger than any reinforced steel. It's tremendously strong, but it's also very light. So off it carries the young spiders to their new homes. Gossama. It suggests something very, very delicate and almost weightless and fine and beautiful. 
my dictionary says gossamer also means in the late period of summer. Right? Wow, I didn't know that. No, it's okay. <laughs> There's a special word for this summer becoming autumn in Germany. Yes, that might be the time when we see these, uh, these fields maybe covered. Also, so. Yes, maybe there's a time for that, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And in French it has a beautiful ma uh, um, name. Fil de la Vierge. Mm -hmm. The Virgin's Threads. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So that, uh, that gossamer marriage hall where mind unites with form is hidden from us by a tapestry of dreams. A tapestry, again, it's a wall hanging, usually with beautiful pictures woven into it. But this, this is not woven cloth. This is a tapestry of dreams, uh, where mind meets form. Hmm? So, heaven's meanings, the things that, the messages and, that heaven wants to convey to us or to express in form, they steal through that hall or that tapestry as through a veil. They pass through from the world of mind into the world of form. It's inner sight. It's not our outer physical sight, but the subtle sight sustains this outer scene. Our material scene here, which we see with our outer physical eyes, is supported by the inner sight of that Gossamer marriage hall. Yes, it's a way that the powers, the subtle powers, which we don't see but which move our days, if they can pass through this gossamer marriage hall, they can pass through this tapestry of dreams. They can influence us. We will read more later on about the way in which these powers of the subtler worlds, not our own world, um, influence us, influence our, first of all, our dreams and our thoughts, our words, our actions. All this is sustained by that inner sight. Here it means anything that you can pass through. It's a way through. Uh, Ganga Lakshmi. The final consciousness with happy lines. It has a tact or touch cannot attain. A purity of sense we never fail. Its intercession with the eternal memory inspires our transient earth's brief being attains a beauty and the perfect shape of things. Mm. So the consciousness of that world is much finer than our consciousness. And it moves on happier lines. It has a tact our touch cannot attain. It's a pun, a word with two meanings. A tact actually does mean touch, something that's tactile. You like to touch it because it has, it's interesting to touch. But we also use it in a psychological sense. There are certain people who know exactly how to put things in a very delicate way or arrange for things to happen so that you hardly notice it, but just the right thing happens. No? So that world is like that. 
It arranges things beautifully. Our clumsy touch, our physical touch, can't achieve that kind of tact, that kind of a delicate touch. It has a purity of sense. So touch is one of the senses. No? There are other senses, hearing, sight, taste. Mm. So that finer consciousness has a purity of sense that we gross human beings, we never feel. But it communicates with the eternal ray, the supreme ray of consciousness. It intercedes, it, <coughs> it asks from that eternal ray to give boons, to do something for our world. And it's that communication of the subtle, the world of subtle matter with the eternal ray which inspires our human brief-lived attempts at beauty. Artists feel inspired. They get some glimpse they want to express in words or in music or in painting or drawing. Whatever uh, here we feel inspired to make a perfect shape of things, it's because there's been a communication between the subtle world and the, the higher world, asking for help for our earth. Lady at the back. Ma'am? In terms of the young divinity of power and early play of the eternal child, the embodiments of his outbeam thoughts laved in bright everlasting wondrous things and loved by whispers of the music air, take dream to trust like birds on timeless trees. Before they die on foot, to float on earth by the sea. It's a beautiful picture Sri Aurobindo gives us. No? He says, when creation is happening in, in rooms of the young divinity of power, when things are just beginning to be expressed, the early play of the eternal child. The eternal child, I think, is the Hiranyagarbha, the golden embryo who rules the subtle worlds and sends his dreams and thoughts into our world. So there are, there are rooms where that eternal child is playing and expressing or exploring his power. The embodiments of his outwinging thoughts so his thoughts go out, pro he projects them, they fly out as like birds with wings, but they have taken form. It's at this marriage hall where mind takes form, unites with form. So those embodiments, those forms which his thoughts take, get bathed laved, it's like washed or bathed in colors, in the tints, the beautiful colors of a bright everlasting wonder. They're, they're, they're like birds with beautiful shining plumage, no? But they are also lulled. This is what we do with the baby. We, we rock it we soothe it, we give it peace, no? lulled by whispers of that lucid air, the atmosphere of that world which is full of light. They, because they're lulled, they, they take rest. They take rest, he says, like birds on trees. No? The trees and the birds are resting there before they will 
dive into our world, into the world of time. Here they will float on earth, times, sea. The, the idea of our time as an ocean. So it's a beautiful picture, no? the, the, the divine child imagining, dreaming, and his thoughts take shape, and they put on these beautiful colors, but they sleep, they rest a little while before they dive into our world, and here they will float on earth, time, sea, and perhaps they'll lose some of their bright, everlasting wonders, tints, but they will have forms. They will be active here in the world. Lara is like French lave. Yes, it's from the French word lave. Yeah. But we pronounce it laved. Yes, sir, please read. All that here seems as lovelier semblance they. Whatever our hearts conceive, our heads create some high original beauty for putting, thence exile here consents to an earthly, earthly pinch. You can read the next three lines. Yeah. Whatever is here of visible charm and grace finds there its fortress and immortal lines. All that is beautiful here is there divine. Yes. So whatever our hearts conceive, wonderful, beautiful dreams, or our thoughts, whatever our heads create, they, we create them in ideal forms, no? Our dreams are ideally beautiful. Hmm? But in order to be realized here, they have to leave the beauty of that gossamer marriage hall there. They forfeit, they give up their high original beauty. They're exiled from there. Thence means from there. They have to accept that here on earth they will have this earthly tinge, won't have all those beautiful heavenly colors. It will be earthly. Hmm? That means that whatever is beautiful here, hmm, of visible charm and grace, there, in that world, it finds a much more perfect beauty. It's faultless and immortal lines. All that is beautiful here is there, divine, divinely beautiful. That's about the forms that are here in our world. There they have their divine counterparts. But also in that world, there are things that don't exist here at all. No? Sarojini, will you read, please? Sphere is a perfect, like our crystal in the chamber. It's a perfect sphere. But we also use that word to mean a realm or a country. So, in that world, there are figures that no mortal mind has ever dreamed of. 
and bodies, there are bodies there that have no earthly counterpart. There's nothing like them here in our world. But uh, we may perhaps in dreams, in trance, we may see those forms. They may traverse the inner eyes illumined trance. Not the physical eyes, our inner eyes. When we go deep within, we may see those forms. And they are so beautiful. They ravish the heart. They fill our hearts with delight, with their celestial tread. We feel enchanted. And those forms, the fact that they exist, that we can see them, persuade heaven to inhabit that wonder sphere, that sphere of the subtle physical. It's like a heaven because of the perfect beauty of the forms there. Joel. The future's marvelous wonder in its gallows. Things old and new are fashioned in those depths. A carnival of beauty crowds the heights. In that magic kingdom of ideas, Hmm. So the future's marvels wander in its gulfs. In that world, in the deep places of that world, what's going to be in the future, all the wonderful things that are going to be in the future, they are already there, wandering, hmm, waiting to manifest here. Hmm. And in the depths of that world, things old, and new are fashioned, shaped, given shape. And on the high levels, on the heights of that world, a carnival of beauty, a festival, a joyful festival of beauty crowds the heights in that magic kingdom of ideal sight. So whatever uh, we is seen there is like a kind of ideal for us here if we get a glimpse of it. Slava, will you read? Yes. Hmm. In He, he spoke of the mass marriage hall where mind meets with form. Now he's saying in that magic kingdom of ideal sight, it's antechambers, in palaces, in big buildings where there are important people living or working. Uh, outside their big rooms where they receive people, There'll be small rooms where people have to wait or where the peons wait until they hear the bell and then they know they have to go in. The antechambers, the chambers before the real chambers. So those antechambers are small rooms. They, maybe not many people go there. They're kind of private. No? So he says in those uh, four rooms, those small private rooms, 
matter and soul meet, like lovers secretly. There's a conscious union between the matter, subtle matter, and the soul. And he says, at that stage, their embrace has not yet led to tragedy. <laughs> Later on, perhaps, this meeting of matter and soul becomes not so happy. But at that point, um, they can clasp, they can embrace in this passion, this love, which is not yet unfortunate. So matter and soul can join the different kinds of strength and sweetness and delight. They can mingle and mix and make the high worlds and the low worlds into one world, this meeting of matter and soul. There's a little bit of Sri Aurobindo's humor here, I think, also. You like to read? You will read, yes. An intruder from the formless infinite, daring to break into the inconscience reign, the spirits leap towards body touch ground. You can continue. Has set unwrapped in earthly lineaments. Already it was outlasting death and birth, convincing the abyss by heavenly form, a covering of its immortality, aligned to the luster of the wearer's rank, fit to endure the rub of change and time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, the spirit's leap, leaping down from its spirit world down to our earth. Mm? There in the kingdom of subtle matter, it touches ground for the first time. Subtle matter, not gross matter. Mm? It's not yet having to wear its earthly lineaments. It's earthly features. Your lineaments are the features of your face. So it's not yet uh, wearing this gross matter. But it's already wearing a covering, a covering of its immortality. Outcast is covered? Hmm? Outcast is covered? No, a few lines down it says it wears a covering of its immortality, just a couple of lines below. But that covering of its immortality lasts, outlasts birth and death. Our earthly lineaments, um, they decay when we die, and then we have to put on new ones, no? Or birth. But that covering which it has there in the subtle physical world, uh, uh, lasts beyond uh, birth, death and birth. And it is beautiful. It has a heavenly form. It convinces the abyss, the darker, deeper levels of existence. And that covering of the spirit's immortality is alive, it's responsive to the luster, to the light, the shine, that's appropriate to the rank of the wearer, the, the position in the hierarchy. You know? that, that covering is responsive to the quality of the spirit that's wearing it. You know? And it is fit to endure the rub of change and time. It doesn't wear out like our bodies do. It can, uh, goes on 
unworn out. And now he's going to tell us more about that substance of that covering. In, yes, the spirit, this is the spirit is the intruder from the formless infinite. There, there are no forms. But this spirit is daring to come here onto earth into, under the reign of the inconscient. But first, it touches ground there in the world of subtle matter. And it's already got a covering of its immortality. So some form is there, hmm? which reflects the rank, the, the social position, the hierarchical position of the spirit who is wearing it. And that's a very durable, although we say subtle, it doesn't mean that it's less durable. It means it's more durable. Hmm? Like the gossamer, like so strong, yes. Mm. Um, uh, Devan, you would like to read? Mm. A tissue mixed of the soul's radiant light and matter's substance of sign burdened forth. Imagine waning in our mind's thin air an abstract phantasm mold of mental make. It feels what earthly bodies cannot feel and is more real than this cross of faith. Mm. So this, this substance, which the first covering of the immortality, is a tissue, it's a cloth, a fabric. It's a mixed fabric with two kinds of uh, threads. There's the soul's radiant light and there's matter's substance. And he says that the substance of matter is made up of force, of energy, sign burdened. It's carrying a lot of meaning, significance. Hmm? That's why it's heavy and dense. Hmm? That's that tissue of which the spirit's covering is made. We sometimes see or we hear of such, um, of the spirit with wearing some such thing like that. And we imagine in our mind's thin air, that it is just something abstract. It's just an imagination, a phantasm mold that our mind has made if we happen to see a spirit wearing its subtle physical covering. But he says it's not like that. That's just the vain uh, ideas of our minds. Actually, that uh, tissue and that covering, it f is much more sensitive. It feels what earthly bodies cannot feel and is more real than this grosser frame. Because we are used to these solid, dense physical appearances. If we see something subtle like that, we think it is an imagination, or a, not real. But here Sri Aurobindo is saying it's more real. And he will continue and tell us more about it. You like to read? <coughs> After the falling of mortality's cloak, lightened is its weight to heighten its ascent. Defined to the touch of final environments, it drops old pattern of pals, pals. Pals of denser stuff, cancels the grip of earth's descending pull, and bears the soul from world to higher world, till in the naked ether of the peaks, 
the spirit's simplicity alone is left, the eternal being's first transparent room. Uh, please read the next three lines also. But when it must come back to its mortal load, and the heart ensemble of Earth's experience, then its return resumes that heavier dress. Hmm. So that heavier dress, that's uh, our earthly bodies, no? After the falling of mortality's cloak, when our spirit, when our soul leaves the body and drops that cloak which is subject to death, mortality. Can I just ask one thing? Yes. In this break from this sentence, is it right there is a complete shift of the topic? Of course, before he was like talking about things coming down from the sphere, and suddenly I never really understood this. Is it like now it's about this, the, the, the spirit of someone that is coming up? Um, on, page, on line 85, he speaks about the spirit's leap towards body touches ground. So that's about the spirit choosing to incarnate uh, on earth. Hmm? Okay. Yeah? And it doesn't immediately incarnate in this dense physical matter. First of all, it puts on a covering. It covers up its immortality, its spirit form. It covers it with this mixed tissue, this t tissue which is mixed of the soul's radiant light and matter. And uh, that's the kind of covering that we might see if we get a glimpse of a subtle being. And that subtle covering is very plastic and flexible and um, corresponds to the state of the wearer and it's also very durable. It doesn't decay like our substance does. Mm. So that substance, that, uh, that covering, when the body falls away, the physical body falls away, then that covering becomes lighter. Mm? Lightened is its weight to heighten its ascent. It can rise to higher worlds. It's the substance itself is refined to the touch of finer environments. The mother has spoken about this, how she learned uh, when she was studying occultism to um, to project her subtle physical body out of her physical body, then perhaps leaving the physical body lying quietly, safely somewhere. She could go out in her subtle physical body and move in this world of subtle matter. And then she could, out of the subtle material body, she could exteriorize one more time into the, the life body, the vital body, and then again into a mind body and several different mind bodies. She said she could do it totally 13 times. And she has shown us that map of all the different levels corresponding to those bodies. So each higher body is of a finer substance than the one below it. And what he's saying in this passage is that when we, when we leave our physical bodies, then we can go higher and higher in our various subtle bodies until we get right up to the, um, we move, the souls move from world to higher world until they reach right the peak, the highest levels in the naked ether, that rarefied atmosphere of the peaks, just the spirit is simply what it is. It doesn't need any covering anymore. Hmm? It's just the transparent robe of the eternal being. But then when the eternal being wants to return, when it must come back 
to its mortal load, taking on these heavier uh, tasks, hmm? back to the hard ensemble of this collection of densities and difficulties here on the earth, then the spirit, the soul, in its return, one by one, it puts on these heavier dresses. No? Well, I have uh, one question about substance. Yes. Uh, when mother grew up, body to another body, the substance changed? Yes, the substance changed, yes. And the substance corresponds to the consciousness. And this is actually the mechanism of transformation. If, if the consciousness becomes strong enough, then it can transform the substance correspondingly also. And when mother was traveling in the ship, there was a cyclone. Yes. She lay on her bunk, yeah. And out she went and she talked to those beings. Why are you upsetting all these people? Go and play somewhere else, she said. <laughs> yes, that, was, that would be just the, this uh, subtle physical body that she went in. Mm. Mm. So that's very interesting, isn't it? Paul's. Paul's, again, it's a word with a double meaning. It's a heavy cloth. So it says old patterned Paul's of denser stuff. But the Paul is also especially, it's the cloth, the dark cloth, that we place over a dead body or over a coffin. The Paul bearers. And the Paul bearers, yes, they carry the coffin with, the, with that heavy so when, when, the, when we cast off mortality's cloak, then the spirit is free to cancel the grip of earth's descending pull. It's not subject to gravity anymore. Huh? But From here, you're speaking about both and dying and reverse process, mm. but also this consciously leaving the body and counting. Yes, right. Yes. Shall we stop there for today? He's going to start a completely new topic next. A passage for the powers that move our days, occult behind this grosser nature's walls, a gossamer marriage hall of mind with form is hidden by a tapestry of dreams. Heaven's meanings steal through it as through a veil. Its inner sight sustains this outer scene. A finer consciousness with happier lines, it has a tact our touch cannot attain, a purity of sense we never feel. Its intercession with the eternal ray inspires our transient earth's brief-lived attempts at beauty and the perfect shape of things. In rooms of the young divinity of power and early play of the eternal child, the embodiments of his outwinging thoughts laved in a bright everlasting wonder's tints and lulled by whispers of that lucid air. Take dream-hued rest 
like birds on timeless trees before they dive to float on earth time sea all that here seems has lovelier semblance there whatever our hearts conceive our heads create some high original beauty forfeiting thence exiled here consents to an earthly tinge whatever is here of visible charm and grace finds there its faultless and immortal lines all that is beautiful here is there divine figures are there undreamed by mortal mind bodies that have no earthly counterpart traverse the inner eyes illumined trance and ravish the heart with their celestial tread persuading heaven to inhabit that wonder sphere the future's marvels wander in its gulf Things old and new are fashioned in those depths. A carnival of beauty crowds the heights in that magic kingdom of ideal sight. In its antechambers of splendid privacy, matter and soul in conscious union meet like lovers in a lonely secret place in the clasp of a passion not yet unfortunate they join their strength and sweetness and delight and mingling make the high and low worlds one intruder from the formless infinite daring to break into the inconscient's reign the spirit's leap towards body touches ground as yet unwrapped in earthly lineaments already it wears outlasting death and birth convincing the abyss by heavenly form a covering of its immortality alive to the luster of the wearer's rank fit to endure the rub of change and time a tissue mixed of the soul's radiant light and matter's substance of sign burdened force imagine vainly in our mind's thin air an abstract phantasm mold of mental make it feels what earthly bodies cannot feel and is more real than this grosser frame after the falling of mortality's cloak lightened is its weight to heighten its ascent refined to the touch of finer environments it drops old patterned balls of denser stuff 
cancels the grip of earth's descending pull and bears the soul from world to higher world till in the naked ether of the peaks the spirit's simplicity alone is left the eternal being's first transparent robe. But when it must come back to its mortal load and the hard ensemble of earth's experience, then its return resumes that heavier dress. 